Secret Seven on the Trail by Enid Blyton. It was the winter term before Christmas, and although the Secret Seven were not going to hold many meetings until the holidays, they decided to have a new password, which was Cheeky Charlie, and to keep wearing their little badges with the letters SS embroidered on the button. One day, when Jack was at home having tea with his tiresome sister Susie, she told him that she too had started a secret society. We've got our own badge, and our badge is bigger and better than yours. It's got FF embroidered on it. Ha! Huh. And what does that stand for? It means Famous Five. We've named ourselves the Famous Five after the five in the five books. Sounds much better than Secret Seven. That's silly. And who's in your Famous Society? My friend Kate. And Harry and Jeff and Sam. Oh, them. Yes, them. And we've got a password, just like you have. And we meet every Saturday morning, like you do. You're just a copycat. Well, you wouldn't let me belong to your silly secret seven. And our famous five have got an adventure going already. I don't believe you. You're always telling fibs. Jack didn't know whether to believe her or not, but he went to Peter and told him all that Susie had said. But Peter was sure that Susie and her friends were just playing about. But Jack wasn't so sure, and decided to hide in the bushes outside the summer house where the five held their meetings, and to see if he could hear what they were up to. Unfortunately, Susie spotted him squeezing into the laurel bush and dashed to meet the other four instead of waiting for them at the summer house. What's the matter? Why are you here? Why What's are going you on, Susie? Jack's hidden himself in the laurel bush at the back of the summer house to listen to all we say. I'll go and pull him out. No, Harry, don't do that. I've got a better idea. Let's go down to the summer house. Whisper the password, and then begin to talk as if we really had found an adventure. But why, silly? Don't you see, Kate, that Jack will believe it all? And if we mention places such as that old house up on the hill, Tigger's barn, he'll tell the secret seven. They'll and... all go and investigate it. <laughs> what fun! And we can make up names too. And make Jack think we are right in the middle of something. Come on, let's get to the summer house now, or Jack will be wondering why we are so late. Right, Jeff. But no giggling, anybody, and be as solemn as you can. Jack couldn't hear the password when the five went into the meeting, but he heard plenty when the meeting really began. He was astonished at what the famous five said. They did seem to be in the middle of a most amazing adventure. So, what I want to tell you is that at last I found out that the crooks are meeting at Tigger's barn, that deserted old house up on the hill. Well done, Susie. A deserted, tumble-down old place like Tigger's barn is just right for crooks to meet. Who'll be there? Stumpy Dick and Twisty Tum. Oh, oh that was really, really exciting! exciting. Oh. They're meeting on Tuesday night and planning something we must find out about. So two of us must go to Tigger's barn at the right time and hide ourselves. All right. I'll volunteer. It will be dangerous. But what do the famous five care? You and I will go then, Jeff. That's next Tuesday night, remember? I'll be ready. Suppose Stumpy Dick discovers you. I'll knock him to the ground. <laughs> you, Jeff. Shh. If we giggle, Jack won't believe a word. I can't help it. I mean, Jeff's only four foot tall. Shh. Don't spoil it all. Well, famous five, that's 
that's all on that matter for today. Remember, don't say a word to anyone about Tigger's barn. This is our adventure. I bet the Secret Seven wish they could hear about this. Yes, it makes me laugh to think they don't know anything about it. Come on, this meeting's over. Let's get a ball and have a game. I wonder where Jack is. He might like to play. <laughs> <laughs> of course, they knew quite well where Jack was, and that made them laugh even more as they went up the garden path. As soon as they had gone, Jack crept out of the laurel bush, dusted himself down, and decided to go and tell Peter what he had heard. On the way to Peter's house, he met George and told him about it. Soon the two boys were with Peter, and Jack was telling him how he had hidden in the bushes and what he had overheard. But to Jack's annoyance, Peter didn't take it seriously. Jack, you didn't fall for that nonsense. They're pretending. That's the sort of thing they do at their silly meetings. Well, they sounded serious, and they didn't know I was listening. And Jeff was ready to go and investigate on Tuesday evening. What, Jeff? He'd be frightened of a mouse. He'd run a mile before going to Tigger's barn at night. No, they're just pretending to have adventures or something. Then you don't think it's worth calling a Secret Seven meeting, and ask some of us to go to Tigger's barn on Tuesday? No, I don't. I'm not so stupid to believe in Susie's fairy tales. But suppose they do go and discover something we ought to discover. Well, George, if Jack sees Susie and Jeff creeping off somewhere on Tuesday night, he can follow them. But they won't go. It's all make believe. All right. If that's what you think, there's no use in talking about it any more. But you'll be sorry if you don't call a meeting, and the famous five are having an adventure. Jack marched off very cross, and George went with him. They both felt that Peter had been a bit too certain about it all, and decided that George should go to Jack's house for tea on Tuesday, and then they'd be able to keep a close watch on Susie. But Jack had a surprise when he arrived home, because Susie had asked Jeff over for tea on Tuesday as well, which made Jack think that something really was happening. After they had finished tea on Tuesday, the four children went up to the playroom. They had only been there a few minutes when Susie gave a little cough. <coughs> Jeff, come and see the new clock we've got downstairs. It has a little man on top who strikes an anvil to mark every quarter of an hour.、Uh, oh yes, I'd like to see that. <coughs> come on down then. I'll show it to you. That was just an excuse to get out. Did you see them grinning and winking at each other? Yes, I did. They've gone down to get their coats. We shall hear the front door bang if they go out. We can follow them. Did you hear that? Come on, get our coats on and take our torches, and we'll follow them and give them a big surprise when they get to Tigger's barn. As they went down the garden path. They had no idea that Susie and Jeff were hiding in the hall, roaring with laughter at the trick they had played on them. Jack and George trudged through the darkness towards Tigger's barn, which was about a mile away on a lonely hill, hemmed in by trees. It was a tumble-down shell of a house, only used by a few tramps, and jackdaws who nested there, and a big tawny owl who slept there during the daytime. The two boys came to the building at last. It stood there in the dim moonlight, with part of its roof missing, and a great chimney stack sticking up into the night sky. Susie and Jeff got here pretty quickly. They must have used their bikes. Yes. Now walk quietly. We don't want them to hear us or those two men either, if they've come already. But everything is very quiet. I don't think the men are here. The front door's boarded up. How are we going to get inside? Through this window, it's got no glass in it. Give me a hand up. Right, I'm in all right. I'm right behind you. Where are we? In a big room with a huge chimney place. See it in the moonlight over there. Gosh, what's that? 
Only a rat or something. Don't grab me like that. I nearly yelled out. Shh! What was that? Maybe it's an owl in the chimney. That's not coming from the chimney. It's coming from outside. And it sounds a bit strange. That's not an owl. It's men signalling to each other. They are meeting here then. But where are Susie and Jeff? I don't know. Hidden safely somewhere, I expect. And we'd better hide too. Those men could be here any minute. There's a good hiding place in the hearth. Over there. We can stand in the darkness, right under the big chimney. Come on, quick. I can hear footsteps. I'm with you. Here we are. Keep back. They've got a torch. They're coming now and climbing through the window. Come on in. Nobody's here. Larry hasn't come yet. Give him the signals, Zeb, in case he's waiting for it. He's just outside. Here he is. Gosh, there's three of them now. Shh! Don't speak. Hello, Larry. Come into the next room. There are boxes there to sit on, and a light won't shine out from there as much as it does from this room. I'm going to creep across the floor and go to the door. Perhaps I can hear what they're saying. No, don't. We'll be discovered. You're sure to make a noise. No, I shan't. You stay here, George. I do wonder where Susie and Jeff are, though. I hope I don't bump into them anywhere. Jack made his way very quietly to the doorway that led to the next room. Through a crack in the door, he could see three men sitting on old boxes, studying a map of some kind, and talking in low voices. He could only just hear odd words, and couldn't make out what they were talking about, so he decided to edge a little nearer. But suddenly he leaned against something which gave way, and he tumbled into a cupboard. What was that noise? Rats, I expect. This place is alive with them. Look, you can see in my torchlight there's nobody about. Yes, it was only rats. I'm not so sure. Switch off that light, Zeb. Sit quietly for a bit and listen. Jack sat absolutely still in the cupboard, fearful that the men might come to find out who had made a noise. Poor George, hiding in the fireplace, had heard nothing and wondered what was going on and where Jack had gone. As Jack had the torch, George crept out of the hearth and stood in the middle of the room, wondering what to do. There wasn't a sound to be heard. Perhaps the men have gone. But where's Jack? I don't call out. Perhaps he's nearby, just as scared as I am. I know. I'll use the secret seven password. What was it now? Ah, uh, uh, ah, Cheeky Charlie. That was it. Cheeky Charlie. Cheeky Charlie! Cheeky Charlie! What's all this, then? What do you know about Cheeky Charlie? Come right into the room, boy, and answer my question. I, I, I... Come on in. We heard you saying Cheeky Charlie. Have you got a message from him? I, uh, I, am. Um... Look, will you come into this room? What's the matter with you, boy? Are you scared? We shan't eat a messenger from Charlie. There won't be no message from Charlie. Why should there be? He's waiting for news from us, isn't he? Here, boy. Did Charlie send you to ask for news? Um, yes. Can't think why Charlie uses such a dumb kid to send out. Got a pencil, Larry? I've got a bit of paper in my pocket, so I'll scribble a message. A kid who can't open his mouth and hardly speaks a word is just the right messenger for us. Yes. Uh, tell Charlie what we've decided, Zeb. Don't forget, he's to mark the tarpaulin with white lines at one corner. I'm doing it now. Right. Here you are, son. Take this to Charlie. And don't you go calling him cheeky, Charlie, see? Little boys that are rude get their ears boxed. 
His friends can call him what they like, but not you. Where's Charlie now, kid? At Dorling or Hammond's? Uh, Dorling's. Right. Here's fifty pence. Now clear off. You're scared stiff of this place, aren't you? I can see that. If you want company down the hill, we're all going now. If not, then buzz off. George buzzed off, but not very far. Shaking with fear, he went back into the other room, clambered out of the window, and flung himself into the middle of a thick bush. Terrified, he lay there until he heard the men's voices disappear down the hill. Phew! Now what do I do? Where's Jack? And Susie and Jeff? Shall I go back? Hello, what's that? Cheeky Charlie! Cheeky Charlie! Cheeky Charlie! Cheeky Charlie! Jack? George, why didn't you answer me the first time? You must have known it was me. I wasn't sure. Jack, I've had an awful time. Where have you been? I was listening to those men, and I fell into a cupboard, and it closed on me, and I never heard another word they said. I didn't dare move in case they came to look for me. But at last I opened the door, and wondering where you were, I whispered the password. I see. So you didn't hear what happened to me. The men discovered me, and... Discovered you? What did they do? Well, it's very peculiar. You see, I whispered the password too, hoping you would hear it. But the men heard me whispering Cheeky Charlie, and called me in the room and asked if I had a message from him. From who? I don't know. They must know someone called Cheeky Charlie and thought I was his messenger and they gave me a message for him. It's a note. I got it in my pocket. No. Have you really? Gosh, let me see it. No. Let's get home and read it there. I want to get out of this creepy tumble-down old place. Come on, Jack. Let's go. Yes, but wait. What about Susie and Jeff? They must be here somewhere too. We ought to look for them. Yes, and we'll have to find out how they knew there was a meeting tonight. Let's call them. Those men are gone now. All right, we'll both call together. Susie, Susie Jeff, Jeff, come on out wherever you are. Jeff, Susie, 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 Susie Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. Well, if they didn't hear that, they can't be here. George, I think we'd better go back as quickly as we can and tell Mother that Susie has disappeared. And Jeff, too. Something may have happened to them. They went to Jack's house as quickly as they could, and as they ran up the garden path, the front door opened. And who should be standing there but Jeff and Susie? And both had big grins on their faces. Have you had a pleasant evening? We thought you were... We're missing up at Tigger's barn. <laughs> Serve you right. Who came spying on our famous five meeting? Who heard all sorts of things and believed them? Who's been all the way to Tigger's barn in the dark? Who's a silly Billy? Who's a... You're a wicked girl. You're a wicked girl. Jack and George were both speechless with anger at the trick Susie and Jeff had played on them. And if Susie hadn't dodged behind their mother, who had come to the door to see what was going on, there's no telling what Jack might have done to his sister. As soon as George got home, he sat on his bed and tried to piece together what had happened. He felt in his pocket for the note that the man Zeb had given him, read it carefully, and then telephoned Peter. As soon as Peter heard George's story, he arranged a secret seven meeting for the next day. At five o'clock the next afternoon, every member was sitting around listening wide-eyed as Jack and George told them all about their adventure the previous night. So, George, when you called our password, Cheeky Charlie, those men thought you had come with a message from someone with that name. Yes. And you mean there really is a man called Cheeky Charlie? Yes. And what's more, the man called Zed gave me a note to take to him. Here it is. I'll read it to you. It says, 
Dear Charlie, everything's ready and going okay. Can't see that anything can go wrong, but a fog would be very welcome. Larry's looking after the points. Don't forget the lorry, and get the tarpaulin truck cover marked with white at one corner. That'll save time in looking for the right load. Clever of you to send out his load by truck and collect it by lorry. All the best, Zeb. What's it all about? None of us know that, but it's clear we've hit onto something strange again. Do the Secret Seven think we should try and solve this new mystery? Definitely. Oh, of course. Oh, yes. 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 Well done. Right. Let's first of all try and sort out what Jack heard the men talking about. Right. Mind, I could only catch what they were saying now and again, but they kept saying something about loading and unloading, and they kept on mentioning points. What sort of points? No idea. They said six two quite a lot of times, and then they said maybe seven ten. Oh yes, and they said there mustn't be a moon, and something about darkness and fog. I couldn't make head or tail of it. Sounds as if they were planning something. What else did you hear, Jack? Nothing. That's when I fell into the cupboards and couldn't hear another word. All I can add is that the men asked me if Cheeky Charlie was at Dorlings or Hammonds. Goodness knows what they meant. They could be the names of workshops or works of some kind. We could find that out by going through the telephone directories. But what about this note? It's got the word points here again. And they're talking about trucks and lorries. It's plain there's some robbery planned, but what kind? They want fog too. Well, that's understandable, I suppose. Shall we take the note to the police? Oh no, Barbara, not yet. It's my note, and I'd like to see if we can't do something about it. Well, I'm all for trying. We've got quite a lot to go on with. We know the names of three of the four men. Zeb. Which is probably short for Zebedee, is an unusual name, and Larry, probably short for Lawrence, and Cheeky Charlie, who's perhaps the boss. Yes, and we know he's at Dorlings or Hammonds. So what do we do first, Peter? <coughs> Not another word. There's someone outside. Scamper, find them. Good dog. Someone in the bushes. It's Susie. Jack, it's Susie. How dare you, Susie? How dare you come here listening? Let me go. I'm only copying what you did. Who hid in the laurel bush and... How did you know we were having a meeting? I followed you, but I didn't hear anything because I daren't go near enough with Scamper there. What are you meeting about? As if we'd tell you. Go on, Jack. Take her home. The meeting's over. Come on, you stupid sister. One day I'm going to do something to you that you'll never forget. Right, she's gone. But it just shows how careful we've got to be to keep this our secret. Now, see if any of you can make anything of all the things we've heard. To start with, I'll look for firms called Dorling or Hammond in the telephone directory. Wouldn't it be a good idea to go to the post office? They've got all the directories there, not just the one for our district. That is a good idea, Janet. You and Jack and I will go there straight away. The meeting is now closed. At the post office, they had to go through several directories before they had any luck. There weren't many people called Dorling, but after five minutes, 
Janet became excited. Look, in this directory, E. A. Dorling, Manor House, Tallington, and Messrs. E. Dorling, manufacturers of lead goods, Petlington. Which would be the right Dorling? The manufacturers, I suppose. Well done, Janet. See if there's a Hammond in that directory. H. H A H A M. There's quite a lot of Hammonds. But do look at this one, Peter. Hammond and Co. Limited, lead manufacturers, Petlington. Two firms in Petlington dealing in lead. Cheeky Charlie must be something to do with them both. Lead. Lead's very valuable these days. I'm always reading in the paper about people stealing it. Yes, it looks as if Cheeky Charlie might be going to send a load of lead off somewhere in a truck and Zib and the others are going to stop it and take the lead. As you say, it's very valuable, Jack. Cheeky Charlie must be in a high position if he's in both firms. I wonder why they call him Cheeky Charlie. Because he's bold and has plenty of cheek, I expect. But there's not much we can do. Petlington's miles away. And all we know is that there's two firms dealing in lead. Yes, it doesn't take us very far. We'll have to think a bit harder. Come on, let's go and buy some sweets. Sucking toffee always helps me think. The next day was Saturday, and it was raining hard. The Secret Seven were in the shed eating biscuits provided by Jack's mother. They looked very dismal. Let's get your railway set out, Peter, and lay it out here. And I'll fetch the toy trees and farm buildings, and make it look like the countryside. All right, I'll work one train. Jack, you can work the other one, and Colin, you work the points. And George, that's it. That's what, Janet? Points. Don't you remember? Those men at Tigger's barn were talking about points. I bet they were points on a railway line. Oh, oh yes, well done, Emma. That was very clever of you, Janet. Why should they use points? It must be because they want to switch a train onto another line. A goods train, perhaps, carrying lead. They want to steal the tarpaulin. Would that be covering up the load? It had to be marked white at the corner so that the men would know it. Remember? Yes. They wouldn't have to waste time looking in every truck. There's sometimes thirty or forty trucks in a goods train. The white would tell them which was the right truck. Scamper, guard the door. This is a proper Secret Seven meeting now. I thought of something else. Those figures the men kept saying, six two, seven ten. They could be times of trains. Yes, and they want a foggy night because it'd be easier to switch the train onto a siding. And the driver wouldn't know he'd been switched to a wrong line, and would go on until he came to some signal where the men would be waiting, ready to take the lead from the marked truck. And they'd deal with the engine driver and the guard, I suppose. Oh, I think we ought to tell somebody. No, let's find out more first. Now, goods trains don't publish timetables, so we'll have to go down to the station and see what we can find out. That would be good. Yeah. 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 Colin, you and I will go. Jack and George have had all the excitement so far. Now it's our turn. Come on, down to the station with me. When Peter and Colin arrived at the station, there was a porter standing on the platform with another man in dirty blue overalls who had obviously been working on the line. The two boys went up to the porter just as a train was pulling out. Excuse me. Are there any goods trains coming through? We like watching them. There's one in fifteen minutes time, my boy. Thanks. Is it a very long one? Oh no. The longest one comes in here of an evening. How many trucks do you think it has as a rule, Zeb? Zeb. Oh, thirty, forty. It depends. Uh, what time does a goods train come in this evening? About six o'clock. Twice a week. Six two is supposed to be here, but sometimes it's late. Where does it come from? Plenty of places: Turley, Idleston, Hayley, Petlington. Petlington? Um, I mean, oh yes, anywhere else? I don't know. Garton, Elton, all sorts of places. 
I've got a fine model railway at home. It's got points on it, and I can switch trains from one line to another. Are there any points here? Yes. My mate Larry works them to switch the goods trains from one line to another. They often have to go into sidings, see? If you'd like to come down the line with me, I'll show you the points he uses. I'm working up that way. Thanks. Come on, Colin. Does your mate switch the 6-2 goods train into a siding? No. Larry only switches the goods trains that have to be loaded here. The 6-2 goes right on into Swindon. Gosh, I wish we could see Larry working the points. They'll be a bit different to the ones on my railway set at home. Oh, that's a fact. We're not far away from them now. But don't you ever come onto the railway lines by yourselves. Or the police will be after you straight away. No, we won't. Good, here we are. Here's the points Larry works. You pull this lever for this line, see? Hey, watch how the rails move so that they move the train to that line over there instead of letting the train keep on this line. Um, does the 6-2 come on this line? Yes, but it goes straight on. It never has goods for this district. Anyhow, I'd better be starting work now. Cheerio! Hope I've told you everything you wanted to know. He certainly had. The two boys left the railway so excited that they could hardly stop talking. After a quick dinner, a special Secret Seven meeting was called, and the others sat round thrilled as Peter and Colin told them everything that had happened. When the tale was over, they all went down to the station, and after finding out from the porter that the 6-2 goods train came through on Tuesdays and Fridays, they set off by the side of the track to where the points were that Seb had explained that morning. This is where they planned to switch the goods train off to that sideline. I wish we knew which evening. I think it must be soon, though, because that note that George got said everything was ready and going OK. Let's follow that sideline and see where it leads to. They followed the sideline, which meandered off into a deserted little goods yard. The big gates of the yard were wide open, but only empty railway trucks stood in there now, and not a soul was about. This is a very lonely place. If a goods train was diverted down here, nobody would hear it or see it, except those who would be waiting for it. I bet a lawyer would creep in here one evening and take whatever they are after from the truck with a tarpaulin marked white on one corner. What about coming here on Tuesday evening? Then, if we saw anything happening, we could telephone the police. Shouldn't we get in touch with that nice inspector we like now? Perhaps. Anyhow, let's have a closer look at those points. Hey, you kids there! What are you doing trespassing like this? Come here! I've got something to say to you! Oh no! It's a policeman! What are you doing in this goods yard? Up to some mischief, no doubt. No, we're not. Honest, we aren't doing anything wrong. What did you come here for, then? Tell him, Peter. Oh, so there is something you're after. Now tell me, or I shall take your names and addresses. Peter wasn't going to tell this policeman anything. For one thing, he wouldn't believe the extraordinary tale the Secret Seven had to tell. No, he'd rather tell his father or the inspector they all like so much. It ended with the policemen taking down all their names and addresses one by one. It was maddening to think they had come to catch a gang of thieves and had had their names taken for trespassing. They all went home feeling very miserable, knowing they would get in trouble when their parents heard about it. But they decided that they would say nothing to anyone for the time being, and that Jack, Colin, George and Peter would go back to the yard the following Tuesday evening. When Tuesday came, the four boys arrived at the goods yard about five minutes to six, and went cautiously in through the open gates. Just a foggy sort of night the gang were hoping for, isn't it? Yes. My mother didn't want me to come out in it, unless I took Scamper with me. <laughs> that was lucky. Listen, isn't that a lorry engine ticking over? The gang are here, and the lorry's sent by Cheeky Charlie. 
and they've got a lantern. It was this Tuesday then. I'm glad we didn't come all this way in a thick fog for nothing. Gosh, what's that? Fog signals on the line to warn the driver to go slow and look for real signals. What's the time? Half past six. The six two is late because of the fog. It's getting nearer. It's coming into this goods yard by the sound of it. Larry must have switched the points over and in the fog the driver doesn't realise it. I hope he stops all right. He will. The gang are holding up a red light, like a signal. Let's go over to that shed. We can see everything without being seen. The train stopped and the driver's jumping down from his cab. He's lost and doesn't know where he is. That's Larry running up to him with the lamp. Shh, let's listen to what they're saying. Hey there, driver, you're on the sideline. You ought to be on the main line running through the station. Aye, I should be. There must have been a mistake at the point. My fireman thought something was wrong. Is our train safe here, mate? Safe as can be. You're in a good yard, well off the main line traffic. Better not move till you get the orders. This fog's terrible. Uh, it's a good thing I got on the sideline, that's all I can say. Harry, drop your shovel and come on down. Yeah, here comes my guard. Hello, Fred. Someone's made a mess of the points. Be here for the night, I suppose. Well, mates, you three get into that shed over there. You can make yourselves a cup of something hot. I'm in charge of this yard, so don't worry. I'll telephone for orders for you. Uh, thanks, mate. Uh, come on, Fred, Harry. Let's get a hot drink. They've gone into the shed. Hello. What's this? Isn't that Zeb running down the side of the trucks? Yes, and he stopped at one of them. Now he's running to the lorry. It's the seventh one. Take the lorry down to it. I bet that's the truck with the white marking on the tarpaulin. Yes, they're pulling it off and climbing up into it. They're moving something heavy in the truck. Sheets of lead, I expect. Peter, don't you think we should call the police now? Yes, come on. There's a telephone in that little brick building over there. I noticed the telephone wires this afternoon. We shall have to pass their lorry, so run as fast as you can. Right, now! <laughs> well, we've made it, and no one saw us. Thank goodness. Where's Peter? Huh? Peter! Peter! Gosh, where is he? He started off with us. Oh, there you are, Peter. Where were you? I nipped into the lorry cab and took the ignition key. Gosh, that was smart, Peter. And now, let's phone the inspector. Peter climbed through the window of the little brick building, and it wasn't long before he was talking to an astonished inspector and telling him how Cheeky Charlie and his gang were in the goods yard stealing lead from a railway truck. When he had finished, the inspector told him not to move, and that two policemen would be there straight away. But it seemed a long time before any police cars came, and eventually Peter felt as if he should go and see how the gang was getting on. He crept out into the yard and made his way to the lorry. It was dark and quiet as he stepped forward. Then, he suddenly bumped into somebody. Hey, what are you doing? You! It's that kid who was asking questions the other day. What are you up to, eh? Let, let me go! Scamper! Oh, ah, oh, you 
Ow, you scrap! What's up, Seb? What's up? A boy and a dog. We'd better get going. Is the loading finished, Charlie? That kid may give the alarm. Where is he? Why didn't you hang on to him? The dog bit me, and they both disappeared in the fog now. Come on, let's get out of here. Quick, it's the police in the lorry, all of us. Try the at me if they try to stop us. Start a Zeb, you ninny. Come on. I can't. The key's gone. He must have dropped down. Game's up, Charlie. Caught you all right on the spot. You wouldn't have if we could have got this lorry to move. Who's got the key? That's what I want to know. Where's got the key? I have. Took it myself so that you couldn't get away. Good boy, Peter. Smart lad. You little devil. I should have done for you when I... Cut that out. And it's no good struggling any of you. There's too many of us. Take them to the cars. Oh, Come on, Ellis. Oh, oh. You... Ah, Careful oh, now. You oh. get that car oh, around there. Oh, Hello? Who are these three men? Oh, that's the engine driver and the fireman and the guard. They don't know what's been happening. What's been going on out here? One of my constables will tell you all about it. Now, you boys, I'll walk back home with you. There's no room in the cars for me now. There's a bit of a squash in there at the moment. Then he and the four boys and Scamper trudge back to Peter's house. How amazed his mother was when she opened the door and found the four of them with the inspector. Oh, dear! What have they been up to now? A policeman has just been round complaining about Peter trespassing on the railway the other day with his friends. Oh, don't say he's done anything terribly wrong. So, Peter's astonished parents and an excited Janet listened as the inspector told the whole story of what had happened that evening. When at last he left, he was beaming and full of admiration for the Secret Seven. When the boys and Janet and Scamper were finally alone, Peter looked very solemn. Tomorrow we shall call a meeting of the Secret Seven and ask the Famous Five to come along too. But why? Just so we can tell them how the Secret Seven managed their affairs and to thank them for putting us on the track of this most exciting adventure. Ha! <laughs> Susie won't like that! She certainly won't, Jack. Famous five, indeed. This will be the end of them. Up with the secret seven! Hurrah for us! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray!